All right, thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Jim Campbell. I teach history at Stanford University. Uh, it is my privilege and my great pleasure to uh, introduce today's panelists, after which um, I'm going to shut up. Uh, a couple of ground rules. Uh, this, the reason that there are these blinding lights, uh, this, is, this event is being recorded by C-SPAN. So one consequence of that is uh, they have asked that we use the microphone for questions from the floor. I'm afraid there's only one. So uh, my hope would be that, um, I hope we don't get one of these endless cues, but if you do have a question and are able, please uh, come forward and um, speak into the microphone with your questions. <coughs> If uh, you're not able, we'll try to get the microphone to you. Um, the speakers will speak, I hope, uh, expect quite briefly, and we will then um, throw this open into a conversation. It is, as all of you know, if you've been watching you know, the, your C-SPAN today, this is a signal day in American history. Um, Barack Obama gave a speech today in Austin, Texas at the LBJ Library where uh, there is a civil rights uh, roundtable taking place there, reflecting on the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to go through the transcripts in the future of the events that they're having in Austin. I suspect that the conversation that we're going to have here might be rather different. Uh, given that uh, this is a conference that focuses on the theme of boundaries, it seemed to me that it is noteworthy that the movement that we're going to be talking about today, the movement that emerged in Mississippi and that reached a culmination of sorts in the 1964 Summer Project, was a movement that challenged boundaries and a movement that brought different categories of people into different or unexpected kinds of relationships. Most obviously, it uh, challenged, in many ways, the boundary between black and white. This was a movement which also raised profound questions about the relationship between women and men, between Mississippians and those who came from outside Mississippi, between the young and the older. And the panelists today all have, I think, quite interesting perspectives on each of those boundaries. Let me introduce them, uh, and this is not actually, I think, the order they've just announced. These are organizers. They will speak in the order they choose to speak. Um, <laughs> but I'll give you the um, order that I was prepared to introduce them. Um, the first person I'm going to introduce here is Dory Ladner. Dory comes from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and she is a foundation member of uh, the Mississippi movement. She was recruited into the movement, among others, by Clyde Kennard, who was the advisor to the local NAACP youth chapter. Clyde Kennard is probably not a name that will be mentioned in the uh, events taking place in Austin, but he should be remembered. He was one of three mentors that Dory would later have occasion to bury, the others being Vernon Damer and Medgar Evers. Uh, as a member of the NAACP youth chapter, and as a freshman at Jackson State University, which she attended with her sister Joyce, she was drawn into protests. She was expelled from Jackson State for protesting in defense of the Tougaloo Nine. She later enrolled at Tougaloo. Her civil rights resume is quite extraordinary. She participated in sit-ins. She worked with the Freedom Riders. She was a founding member of COFO. She was one of the organizers of the Mississippi Summer Project. She was director of the project in Natchez, Mississippi. She's also one of the few people I know who has the distinction of having participated in the March on Washington, the Selma to Montgomery March, and the Poor People's March. She has continued, as so many people in the movement of Mississippi have continued in the decades since, to work as an activist in everything from the, move, the, war, uh, the movement to end the war in Vietnam, to community action programs to end poverty, she eventually would spend her professional career as a social worker uh, practicing in St. Louis and Washington, D.C. Uh, Rita Bender is also a person of an extraordinary civil rights pedigree. 
She was first drawn into activism as a member of the downtown uh, chapter of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where she worked alongside her then husband, Michael Schwerner. Uh, Michael and Rita, in the winter of 63, 64, drove to Mississippi in their VW Beetle and opened up the core center, what was by that time COFO Center, in the 4th Congressional District in Meridian, Mississippi. There they endured extraordinary harassment, which culminated uh, on June 21st of 1964, when Michael Schwerner, along with his companions James Cheney and Andrew Goodman, were murdered in Neshoba County. Rita continued to work in the movement thereafter. She participated in the uh, Mississippi Free Democratic Party's credentials challenge at the 1964 Democratic Convention. I believe she gathered affidavits for a suit brought by Arthur Kenoy and others, another name that should be remembered here today, uh, trying to get the um, federal officials to intervene in, uh, against local lo law enforcement in the state of Mississippi. She practices as a lawyer. She is today a principal at Skellinger and Bender in Seattle, where she specializes in family law, adoption, and assisted reproduction. She and her husband, Bill Bender, are also teachers. They actually went back to Mississippi and taught a course on education at the uh, University of Mississippi and are currently teaching a course on educational equity and education as a civil right at Seattle Law School. Uh, last but not least, is Charlie Cobb. Charlie Cobb grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, in Washington, D.C., but his Mississippi roots run deep. His great-grandfather, in fact, was a founder of New Africa, an all-black colony in the Mississippi Delta established in the 1880s. And if you know where to look, you can still see a road sign that says New Africa Road. Uh, after his freshman year at Howard, he got on a bus to go to a civil rights training uh, meeting in Houston, Texas, stopped off in Jackson, and basically never left. Uh, as Dory Ladner says, he got gamed. Um, Charlie would work as a SNCC organizer, chiefly in Sunflower County in the Delta. Um, he would, in 1964, be one of the primary architects of the Mississippi Summer Project, though he was also someone who opposed the project. It was, I'm sure many of you have seen this document, it was Charlie who wrote the perspective, prospectus for the Freedom Schools, schools intended, in his words, to fill an intellectual and creative vacuum in the lives of young Negro Mississippians and to get them to articulate their own desires, demands, and questions. Like the other panelists, Charlie Cobb has remained an activist in the decades since. He has also worked as a journalist for National Public Radio, for National Geographic, where he was the first black staff writer, for AllAfrica.com. He is today a professor of Africana Studies at Brown University, and I'll embarrass him when I say he is probably the only person uh, on the Brown faculty who never went back for a second year of college. He is the author, also, of a series of books that are quite extraordinary, Radical Equations, Civil Rights from Mississippi to the Algebra Project, co-authored with his colleague and friend Bob Moses, On the Road to Freedom, a guided tour of the Civil Rights uh, Trail, and last but not least, and I have a flyer. This is the title we all wish we had. This nonviolent stuff will get you killed. <laughs> How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible, a book that is published, uh, is in press right now, and will appear in a few months with BASIC. Um, and we have flyers for the book here. And um, so, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming and in thanking our speakers. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we intend to leave a lot of time for questions or back and forth or dialogue, so I'm going to be brief and speak in broad stroke. 
Uh, the, most often, the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project or the 1964 uh, Freedom Summer uh, is described as a string of events uh, devoid of context. And this reflects a larger movement, a larger problem with how the Southern Freedom Movement has been described uh, by uh, historians. So before getting into a few comments about the 1964 Summer Project, since I'm in an audience of historians, uh, I would like to comment on, on one or two uh, complaints <laughs> I have about the history, not just of the project, but of the movement. Uh, 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 one of my perspective, of course, is, is that of participant, an active participant uh, in the Southern Freedom Movement and the Mississippi Movement in particular. Um, so um, what am I talking about when I say that? Well, I've been a working reporter almost all of my professional life since leaving uh, the state of Mississippi in the late 1960s. And one of the earliest lessons I learned thinking about reporting and, and the way news worked in the United States uh, uh, and the way it worked in the public mind is that it's shaped more by what's left out than by any bias that might appear in copy or, or in uh, broadcasting. Uh, one, it's easy to spot bias in news or it's easy to spot bias at any level. It's a lot harder to make a judgment or reach a real judgment about something if the information you need to reach judgment about it has been left out. And when it comes to the movement, I think, the same thing can be said, and it uh, really oversimplify even this. I mean, Martin Luther King, for example, has been reduced in the public mind to an I Have a Dream speech. Stokely Carmichael has been really reduced in the public mind to someone who shouted out black power and thus destroying the good movement of love and nonviolence and redemptive suffering. Julian Bond, uh, my friend and former SNCC colleague, likes to summarize the movement sometimes the way the public thinks of the movement as, well, Rosa stood up, Martin sat down, then the white folks saw the light and saved the day. <laughs> now this, in fact, is an old problem that, uh, you know, this is not a 20th century problem or even, even a Southern Civil Rights Movement uh, problem. And, and in, in, Speaking uh, briefly about this problem, I feel compelled uh, to make a reference to Frederick, of a complaint by Frederick Douglass way back in 1855 in his autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom. And what Douglass complained about was that William Lloyd Garrison and other influential white abolitionists thought that his intellectual growth weakened their cause. They only wanted him to, quote, narrate wrongs, bemoaned Douglas, although after escaping from slavery, quote, I was now reading and thinking. However, said John A. Collins, general agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, if he did not have, quote, the plantation manner of speech, people won't ever believe you was a slave. It is best that you not seem to learn the abolitionist went on to tell Douglas with no small degree of arrogance, quote, give us the facts. We will take care of the philosophy. Now, <laughs> I think this is as relevant today as it is now. What is missing? There are a lot of things missing from the historiography. But what is particularly noticeable to me, anyway, what is missing? and crucial to understanding what took place not just in Mississippi in 1964, but across the South is the thinking of movement people. I mean, events, actions, and activities did not just come out of nowhere. They were thought about, they were discussed, they were debated. 
And if you really <coughs> want to understand uh, what happened in 1964 in Mississippi, you have to understand the thinking related to the time and place that people who were struggling against a white supremacist system were engaged in. This 1964 summer project did not uh, uh, happen independent of this thought. And most importantly, this thought came not from the top down by intellectual elites, but bubbled from the bottom up from people who weren't ordinarily paid attention to, uh, who had ideas about taking on, tackling, and in the final analysis, destroying uh, white supremacy. So to understand the Mississippi Summer Project of 1964, you have to look from the bottom up and not the top down. You have to wonder what got Dory Ladner from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to Jackson State, to Tulu College, to SNCC, to Natchez, Mississippi. And I, you know, I could take the next five hours and talk to you with Dory Ladner stories. But what's going on in her head? A whole lot of people. Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, a woman with a sixth grade education, lived all her life on a cotton plantation. Yes, she's heroic, yes, uh, she was bold, but what is she thinking about? How should we understand what her thoughts represent in terms of the people of Mississippi, particularly the black people? And you have to recognize that the roots of the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project sprout from this grassroots determination to dislodge white supremacy, something people have been thinking about and wrestling with for over 100 years. Ever since the betrayal of Reconstruction, this, the, you know, this thought of tackling white supremacy uh, existed. We had, very briefly, if you talk to people, and I'm talking about 1963, 1962, 1961, uh, Mississippi, you know, several problems we were grappling with in our, in our thoughts. How do you get the country to pay attention to Mississippi? Nobody cared about Mississippi. How do you get the country to pay attention to Mississippi? How do you get the federal government to pay attention to Mississippi? And our answer was at once simple and complex. You bring the country's children to Mississippi. The country will pay attention to their children in a way that they won't pay attention to either Charlie Cobb or Dory Ladner or any of number of other people uh, that uh, made the Mississippi uh, movement. More specifically, what do you do about murder? How do you handle that when nobody cares about the people who are being murdered? And what is your responsibility to murder? This is a complicated question. For instance, if people are being killed because they're doing things that you're urging them to do, what's your responsibility to them? And that's both a moral question and an ethical question in the sense of really, when it comes down to self-defense, could you really kill somebody? That's also a question of responsibility, as I said. What are your obligations to people who are in danger because of doing what you ask them to do? And it's also a very practical question. What do you have to do to stay alive? These kinds of thoughts shaped the movement. These kinds of thoughts led us outside of the boundaries of Mississippi to see where we could find at least partial answers to this. And one partial answer, as I said, was to bring the country's children to Mississippi, expose them. And that's not as cynical as it may sound. It's a common sense 
approach to tackling this enormous problem that had been building uh, for centuries. And as it turned out, even though I was opposed to the project, the project was successful. <laughs> Country paid attention to Mississippi. Country was irreversibly changed by what maids, sharecroppers, cooks, gardeners, small farmers, small entrepreneurs did in Mississippi. They changed the National Democratic Party enough so that in the 21st century we have Barack Obama. It forced white supremacists in many ways out of the Democratic Party, although it means with another problem of white supremacists in the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it forced a range of social issues. It brought them to the surface, and that includes both uh, uh, gender issues with respect to women's rights and uh, uh, large issues that are still unresolved, like education, it forced <laughs> that issue. I think the project, and I'll conclude with this, and I'm sure you'll have many questions. Uh, I think the Mississippi Summer Project, and I may be biased or partisan toward Mississippi, forced the country to have a conversation about what the country should be that it was reluctant to have and resistant to having. And at least one remaining question is for today is, can we have that conversation today? Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. You set the tone for us. And uh, I must say that I'm very happy that we persuade the late Lars Giot and I persuaded you to stay in Mississippi. <laughs> He was on his way to Houston, Texas, he stopped at the uh, Freedom Party office in Jackson, Mississippi, and Guillaume asked him why was he going down there when he was right in the middle of the movement, so um, he stayed. But I would like to say good afternoon to all of you and thank you for being here. Georgia is a place that is special to me in a way. Um, I'll just give you a brief little history. My great-great-grandfather, Peter Lawson, was born in Niles County, Georgia. My great-grandmother, Laura, Lawson married Duncan Adams McLeod, and they migrated to Mississippi, and that's how I came into being. Um, and going on down to Mississippi, I grew up in a house with a very strong mother whose family was very, very um, independent. Mother taught us from the age of three on up to not ever bow to anyone, uh, what, no matter what their color was. She grew up in Wayne County, Mississippi from the Woolard and Gates family. And uh, they were independent people who owned their own land and uh, were very self-sufficient. Mother started training us uh, to always look white people in the eye when you talk to them, never look down, never look back. But she used to say, um, I grew up with them, I, I fought with them, and uh, just just fight them, don't, don't look back. So. I grew up with that. It was not a valid uh, kind of lesson, but it was one of independence. And I took that to heart. So, skipping along, I grew up in Palmer's Cross in Mississippi, uh, which is right off Highway 49, for those of you who know uh, Mississippi, going down to the Gulf Coast and New Orleans, Louisiana. Palmer's Cross was a, small, was a small segregated town with a school and a church, and everybody knew each other. I had a very large extended family that we drew upon, my grandmother, and my mother and her 10 brothers and sisters. My father, Eunice Latner, was from Pearl River County. And um, his family moved to California quite early on after my parents divorced. My mother remarried and had six children. So uh, going into my schooling, I attended segregated schools, never had a new textbook. Um, the school we attended had very poor equipment and uh, the teachers were very devoted to us, and we learned and, and made gains in spite of the surroundings and the um, things that we had to undergo. Uh, dirt roads, sewer run, running in the streets. Um, I remember the chemistry lab, the, the toilet rather, in the school. 
running at the, uh, feces running outside of the toilet onto the school ground before we got a new school, Earl Trevelyan Attendance Center. All of these things uh, came into play, but my dreaming every day was beyond Palmer's Crossing and wanting to know what was beyond Palmer's Crossing. Hattiesburg, as you know, had two colleges, William Carey College and Mississippi Southern at that time. We couldn't attend those colleges, but it, I think it had, um, in a, those colleges had an effect on the, the climate of um, white supremacy, and being close to New Orleans also tempered it. The um, college did not lend itself to the black community. I don't remember participating in anything that the college uh, advocated, the colleges rather. I must say that um, I grew up in a community which was an outpost of Camp Shelby. I don't know if you are familiar with Camp Shelby. And uh, Hattiesburg had the dichotomy of being a very religious town and also a very uh, nightlife kind of place. And Palmas took on all of it. So most of the people sold bootleg liquor, made, uh, made their livelihoods off that because the work was very menial for the most part of people, not a minister or a school teacher or somebody else. And the sheriff would come and collect money every week, every Monday, up and down my street, sticking his hand out the window and going on to other houses. So, and the music was blasting, the blues and so forth. So I um, grew up with the appreciation of the, the blues and the music and so forth. I also knew about uh, the liquor being sold, and I also knew about the church. And all those ingredients went into my being who I am with the foundation that my mother had given us. Going on to, um, to the NAACP, Mr. Clyde Kennard, uh, if you don't know him, please uh, read up on him, K-E-N-N-A-R-D. He attempted to enroll in the University of Southern Mississippi in 1958, and he was sentenced to seven years of hard labor in Parchment Penitentiary for allegedly receiving chicken feed. Uh, his mother was, ran a chicken farm. Uh, Mr. Vernon Damer, another one of my mentors, um, was killed years later fighting Ku Klux Klan right through a Molotov cocktail in his house, and uh, he, was, uh, bur he sustained multiple uh, burns and died from smoke inhalation. Um, we went to NAACP meetings in Jackson, Mississippi with Mr. Ken Mr. Uh, Damon's sister, Eileen Beard. My mother let us go with her because she played the piano at our church. That's where I, I met Meg Evers, a man who uh, communicated with us on a, uh, at the age of 14. It could, it could make me understand that I was living uh, a life that was not fruitful in the sense that segregation had its limitations, meaning that we didn't have sidewalks, we didn't have paved streets, we couldn't sit down in Woolworths, although we'd go downtown to pay bills, we couldn't stop at the counter. And I, I remember buying peanut brittle candy and uh, going to the segregated toilets in Sears white women and colored ladies, and I always looked at that, uh, trying to figure out white women and colored, white ladies, colored women, and I would stare at it, and what was the difference? And the white water fountain, the colored water fountain. And after graduation from high school, I went to Jackson State. I was president of dorm council, it was called after prayer called into the uh, dean's office and wanted to question me about prayer. I, I couldn't understand that. And coming from Palmer's Crossing, where I had not participated in anything political, to my knowledge, uh, organizing and so forth, the prayer was questioned. So Dean Gill said, Ms. Ladner, um, we want to know about this prayer that the matron had told him. So um, I became very adamant. And then was sent to the dean of students, Dean Rogers, who had attended Tougaloo, Harvard, and come back and got his PhD from uh, Divinity School. Mr. And he said, Mr. Ladner, I'm going to hit you before I ship you. But all of that going into uh, my head, my sister Joyce was there as a stand, you know, bystander. And I started saying, well, I don't want to participate here if you don't, if you're going to question my prayer. Who are you to question my prayer? And I didn't realize I had all this in me. Who are you to question my prayer? And I started standing at my feet. I guess mother would have been a little surprised and disgusted with that, you know, insulting the elder. So um, it, 
Jackson State, the two little students uh, were going to have a sit-in at the library, and we got word of that. So one of the teachers from Jackson State drove us to Tougaloo College, where we met with the president of, of, of Tougaloo. And that's, that school was founded by the uh, American Missionary and the United Church of Christ. And they had had a continuous um, integrated staff since its inception around the 1870s. And Dr. Biden was president at that time. We went into his mansion and talked with him. And it was said that if we participated, we'd be sent to the state pen penitentiary because we were from the public schools, Jackson State students. So the Tougaloo students would be taken care of by the school. So Dr. Ryder, a white man from Mississippi State, said, you should have a prayer meeting on the campus at Jackson State. And we took his word for it. We attempted to have a prayer meeting the following week. And the president came, we gathered around the reflecting pool after um, the library closed. The president came running out of his house, flailing his arms, knocked my sister Joyce's uh, roommate down on the ground, and, uh, started screaming, and we ran to our dorms, and he ordered uh, the girl who had fallen to be sent home that night. She lived in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, on the Gulf Coast, and she went. The next morning, I saw canine dogs on the campus. I'd never seen a canine dog. I didn't know what they had, police dogs. But to make a long story short, we attempted to march in solidarity with students from Jackson State, with Tougaloo, and um, we were stopped by the Jackson police, tear gas, I sustained tear gas, burns on my head and in my back. And we were running and the dogs were chasing after us on this small street because they had blocked the main street, Lynch Street. And we ran into the black community running up and down and I ran into a lady's house and the lady said, come on in baby and wash the tear, tear gas off my face and off my back because tear gas burns very badly. And she said, come and sit on the porch. I sat on the porch and the police were running up and down the alley with these dogs and uh, all of us were able to get into a house. Someone told us that white women in that community, which live in a adjoining neighborhood, let some of the students crawl under their houses to escape from the police. We, none of us were arrested. None of us had to go to the hospital. We went back to the campus. The president called an early spring break, and school was over. So when we returned, school was out for the summer. And I, I enrolled at Tougaloo College, but I want to emphasize one thing. When I got back to Tougaloo, I met all of the Freedom Riders who had remained in Mississippi. And they were in the body of Charles McDew, Tom Hayden, Diane Nash, James Bevel, Paul Brooks, John Lewis, Dion Diamond, and many others uh, who had decided they were going to stay in Mississippi and organize. And they had been in uh, Macomb, Mississippi, uh, working with students there with Bob Moses. So I was like, where have you been? I've been looking for you all in my life. <laughs> and uh, it was just a feeling, a good feeling. So Tougaloo was, was an exceptional school in that you could sit on the grass, you could talk, boys could come in the dorm where at Jackson State, you had to be in your room at 9 o'clock, you couldn't come out. And so, uh, people like Pete Siegel were coming on campus, Joan Baez came on campus, Bob Dylan came on campus, many, many people came. And it was just a place for growth and development and, and intellectual challenge. So I got involved and we were going to Jackson every week and um, participating uh, with the Freedom Rise and going to the Freedom House and learning how to do community organizing and um, learning ideas from Diane Nash and James Bell about uh, nonviolence and so forth. So when school was out that year, I decided I was going to commit myself to the movement. I went home that, that summer at 62 and I told my mother, I said, Mother, I, I packed a little orange suitcase. I'm going to Jackson. I'm going to work with Bob Moses to get my freedom. And I dashed out the door. <laughs> <laughs> mother, before Mother could turn around, I was gone. And I called the bus, went to the Greyhound bus station, got on the bus and went to Jackson, went to the Freedom House. And on Rose Street. We stayed there. I was the only female staying there, and um, I have a very strong personality, I guess, because staying with those guys like Lawrence Guillot and <laughs> Curtis Hayes, Hollis Watkins, and others, um, it, was, it was challenging, but um, I stood. <laughs> I think they were kind of scared of me at times. Very strong. Um, <laughs> but um, 
I didn't cook. I didn't learn how to sew at home because I always felt that if I learned those things that I'll be a housewife. I never wanted to be a housewife. Mother said, you go to school, get an education, work, take care of yourself. Don't depend on any man to take care of you. You can marry when you can't do anything else. So that was, <laughs> that was too hard. Yeah, it was. So I didn't learn those things, although I had to help babysit. Mother had several children. I learned how to clean. I, I don't like dirt. I learned how to clean. So in the Freedom House, um, Cody Liddell would come over and cook. She it was Jackson's uh, resident who was president of North Jackson, you know, the ACP. And she um, said that she didn't know how to cook either, but she was uh, the only female, uh, but she had a sister and a lot of brothers. She watched what her brothers were doing. She would come in and scramble the eggs for us and uh, mm -hmm. make some bread or something and feed, have a big pot of eggs and grits for us. And Cola was working for Matt Gales at the time. So that's how we started bonding with Mr. Evers. And Bob would take us, I remember going to Macomb, Mississippi, uh, with Stoker Carmichael, who had a pair of Bermuda shorts. We went to, we went to Liberty, Mississippi, uh, for the, the um, not the Justice Department, one of the organizations that was fighting for human rights to observe us. And uh, we stayed in Liberty all day long. That's where Mr. Herbert Lee had been killed in, um, I think of 61. Uh, um, we stayed there, and uh, I remember observing the white water fountain, the colored water fountain, and waiting for them to start attacking us, but nothing happened. And But they did tell Stokely, you can't come here because you have these shorts on, you got to leave. And that was 1962. So um, after leaving there, we went back to Jackson. We were traveling across the state, and August of 62, we went up to Clarksdale, Mississippi, to found the COFO, Council of Federated Organization, which was an umbrella organization that uh, the NWCP, SCLC, CORE, and SNCC. Uh, this umbrella organization was the one that sponsored the Freedom Summer Project. And um, I didn't know anything about sundown laws. Dave Dennis, who was driving our car from CORE, and there were the three girls in the car, myself included, and Lester McKinney. The police stopped the car, arrested Dave, took him back to Clarksdale, and told us, uh, Dave said, follow us. And we followed Dave back to Clarksdale, and the police said, get the F out of Clarksdale. So we spent the whole night trying to figure out how to get out of the Delta, which we didn't end up at Amazon Moore's house. Amazon Moore was president of local NWCP. And to bring it all back down to Freedom Summer, but this was the background for all the things that I had encountered. And I'm feeling the, the Emmett Till murder, I'm feeling the um, Clyde Kennard incarceration, uh, Mac Charles Park, I don't think I mentioned him, who's thrown in the murder, taken out of jail, thrown in Pearl River after being killed. And um, I'm thinking that I'm committed to this, and Ole Miss was being integrated, and you turn the radio on, you would hear all these rebel yells, and the people beginning to fight, and, James uh, Meredith was trying to get into Ole Miss. And I go back to Tougaloo, and I'm not quite settled. And so uh, I made a commitment to continue working for the movement. All of those ingredients were there. And um, along, I wasn't the only one who joined, but I was one that there weren't very many others. And Bob had about Ten, ten of us, ten or eleven of us who worked the whole state, and we would ride these cars. Anderson Boy had a big rambler car we would ride in, like Bonnie and Clyde and so forth, and <laughs> <laughs> that was another car. But usually, I, I didn't drive. And uh, Willie Peacock was brought into the movement, I don't know if you heard of him, in Greenwood, Mississippi. His, he was on his way to Mahara Medical School, but his father brought Willie Peacock to Bob Moses and said, I'm bringing my son to you to help bring about freedom in, this, in, in the state. And they were Masons, and I didn't understand, but I knew that there was something, some other language being spoken that, that was going on. So uh, Willie Peacock was delivered to Bob for the intent purpose to work for human rights. And there were, were many others of us in the state who felt that way, but we did not know that there were 
people outside, you know, even today I read newspaper articles. Emily, Dr. Emily Crosby sent me some newspaper articles that had been printed uh, back in 62. I had never read it because in, in the state of Mississippi there was a wall of silence. We had no information coming in, no information going out. And we didn't know anything that was going on. And today I'm reading news now that I had never seen before. But I want to start by saying that I lived in a closed society and Mississippi continues to perpetuate the, um, I, I'll use the word insanity in a uh, larger sense, the um, lowest wages that are being paid in, in the state. We have the highest infant mortality rate. The uh, schools are still not up to standard. The wealth is not distributed, not that there's that much, but people are still relegated to subservient um, positions. And uh, I continue to marvel and wonder what is in the minds of people. I don't understand. And with the conservative, so-called conservative movement coming in place, everybody in the state for the most part is poor, but they still try to uphold a certain standard based on uh, white supremacy. But if you talk to a, a white person one on one, they will identify with you, but when they get to the larger audience, they change. And I don't know what that's all about. But I will answer your questions. about 
anniversaries. Because just as the um, Johnson memorials of this week, all of the celebration of this week, is talking about the wonders of the man. He didn't like me too much either, so we're even <laughs> No, no, you can tell that story. <laughs> there is a story. Um, anyway, you know, unfortunately, anniversaries can become a part of reducing history to little more than, than just sound bites and um, uh, sentimentalities. Why does it matter? Well, you as historians know better than I do that if we don't know our history, if we can't learn where we came from, how can we decide where we have to go? How can we understand our place in the long continuum? How can our children and our grandchildren understand their roles? So keep up your work. It's terribly important. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask everyone to turn his or her mic on. The floor is now open, again, uh, in deference to the people who are recording this. If you have questions, I'm going to ask that you come forward to what are now one of the two mic. being opposed to the Freedom Project when it first started. <laughs> I think that was an off-the-cuff remark, but I do know that there were questions about the strategy of, of, of using white college students and also of, uh, of just sort of the way of bringing in this uh, program. I hope you can speak a little more about that, please. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, op the opposition to the Freedom Summer offers an interesting illustration of organizing and the tensions that can exist within community organizing. Uh, to avoid giving you a long, complex answer, uh, I mean, I always saw myself as an organizer in uh, Mississippi, and I felt that although it was slower, the process of, of building at the grassroots got disrupted when you had a huge influx of people who could do far more efficiently what local people could do too. And I felt that you got more from taking the time to have local people do it than, than having outsider people do it. You know, the opposition is miscast as racial opposition. I think the opposition was outsider versus insider. I think Stokely and I used to talk about this. Uh, and Stokely, you know, if he was here, he would say, you know, if you've got a college student who can bang out a leaflet in one minute efficiently, and a high school student who would take 10 minutes to type out a leaflet, it's better to take the 10 minutes with a high school student because the high school student will be in possession of that leaflet and, in a sense, possess the movement. This is the organizer's approach. Now, the, and you have to make a distinction in this comes between organizers and local people. From the perspective of the local person, people from the outside were a good thing. They became, they were less isolated, they force more attention on their situation. Mrs. Hamer backed me into a corner and said, Charlie, I'm glad you came here. Why can't there be more people like you? What kind of answer can I give Mrs. Hamer? I just remained silent. And without exception, every single person we work with in every single community in which we worked 
were favored the summer project. And you were, I was, and those of us who as organizers were resistant to the summer project, were kind of the odd people out in our, in our attitude. Um, in the final analysis, though, you know, you can't, the contradiction is this. You can't, on the one hand, say you think people should have say so about the decisions that affect their lives. You can't, on the one hand, say that people should take charge of their own lives and then turn around and say, well, I don't like your decision about what you want to do with your life, so I'm not going to support you. It, 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 it's a contradiction you can't possibly uh, live with. The arguments over the summer project are far more complicated than what I've told you over this last couple of minutes, and Dory may want to chime in because she was very much in favor I of voted, the summer project. I voted in favor of the summer project because some of the things that I've uh, said to you today uh, made me feel that we needed outside intervention. Mm -hmm. And i would only been out of the state maybe twice in my life, California and Chicago. And I didn't have books to read and newspapers to read, and I wanted other people from the outside to come in to take news out of this. It may sound kind of sim simplistic, but to take news out and let the news come in. And I think we had a book called Mississippi, Mississippi Closed Society. So I was in favor of young people. I had already met uh, some students from Stanford University who had come into the state and uh, were enlightening. Bob had brought them in. And they went to the Delta and so forth for Brandeis, I think. But I wanted outside people to come in and to carry the message out. We didn't have, we had very poor communication. And I, I felt isolated. And I was one of the ones who wanted, uh, the, I've been quoted as saying, wanted the curtain to be pulled back on Mississippi. I wanted people to look in the state and see what was going on, what was happening to us. Meg Evans had been murdered. Uh, we wanted everybody to know that. Clyde Kennard was in Parchman State Penitentiary was trying to enroll the University of Southern Mississippi. I wanted everybody to know that. I wasn't getting news, but I wanted people outside to know. Good Thank you all for service and your work in the movement. I'm curious if you, I'd like you to speak a little bit about the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. When we think about uh, the Voting Rights Act, there's a lot of attention paid to Selma. Selma leads to the Voting Rights Act. And I get the feeling that the Freedom Democratic Party played at least as pivotal a role as Selma in the Voting Rights Act. Can you comment on that? I guess we could all comment on, on that. Look, the, the, the challenge of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party change the Democratic Party. It's interesting to me that, that if you go into political science departments, they really don't study the MFDP. I mean, they study advertising. They study all kinds of things that are outside departments. But it's hard to find any courses on the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, even though they forced what ultimately became known as the McGovern Rules, which expanded the participation of women and minorities in 1972. And those rules grow out of, out of a pledge the Democratic Party made to the MSPP in particular and black people in general in 1964. So it changed the National Democratic Party. There simply would not be, in my view, a Barack Obama without the MSPP's challenge in 1964. Uh, and as I said, it's puzzling and surprising to me that poli sci departments don't study it. And finally, uh, the MFDP, the organizing of the MFDP, you know, the MFDP was not making a protest. And that's often lost, was not making a protest. The MFDP was saying, that the so-called regular Democratic Party of Mississippi was illegitimate. It did not follow its own rules. It did not follow the rules of the National Democratic Party. The MSDP did in electing its 68 delegates and therefore was a legitimate party. And nobody denied the fact that black people denied the right to vote, denied the right to participate in the political process. 
of this. This was not a protest. This was, see us. We follow the rules. These people did not follow the rules. Um, there's a lot more to the MFDP, which deserves a whole panel or plenary session at your next uh, association meeting. I guess, I, I guess I'd just like to, like to add to it that the MFDP came very, very close to being seated by the Credentials Committee. Um, and it was, I mean, it was Johnson pulling every string he could pull that ultimately defeated the seating of the party. And it led to a lot of frustration within the movement, as I think many of you, many of you know. Um, but it was nevertheless, as Charlie says, a, a very, very significant mo moment in American history. Uh, uh. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank um, all three uh, speakers for their reflections and ask you to say a little bit more about something that a few of you sort of hinted around, which is what some historians have called the politics of respectability. Um, and when we think about what was in people's heads, what people were thinking about and fearing about, we know that um, uh, actually um, not long after the Freedom Summer that there were many um, white supremacists who produced pamphlets arguing that the Freedom Summer had just been an opportunity for white and black sex. And that that's really what these outsiders had come to do, had come to, to um, uh, breach the, the, the ultimate uh, cultural barriers that was seen as uh, the most shocking that it could be. And I wondered whether any of these sorts of issues were actually talked about explicitly um, uh, within the movement, um, especially as when you were part of either planning it or thinking about it or during it. <laughs> well, I was very sure. to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's long and short answer, I suppose. Uh, the short answer is, young people, we engaged in sex more than we talked about sex. <laughs> <laughs> And unapologetically, I think. Look, the argument about sex is a very old argument with respect to black struggle. It's not unique to the 1964 Summer Project or unique to the 1960s or SNCC or CORE or somebody like that. I mean, the same people who are f uh, raising this in 1964 were raising it about black GIs returning home after World War I. Uh, you know, uh, before that, uh, you know, go all the way back, and they use various terms, social equality, you know, miscegenation, and all of this. It's a whole and really tired <laughs> argument that happily seems to be dying from at least a slow death. We're not discussing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Mike Honey from the University of Washington, Tacoma. Uh, there was an uh, African-American factory worker named Morales Jackson whose car was bombed and he was murdered in, I think it was in 1963. Natchez. 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 It was in 66, yeah. The um, thing that I often think about with um, the Montgomery bus boycott or the movement in Mississippi is about the class politics or Birmingham where there were a lot of black factory workers and uh, working class people of various <laughs> kinds. Um, do you think in Mississippi that most people in the movement were either students or more in rural kind of places? Or did, was there a black working class that played some kind of role in it? Or not? I'm, I always wonder how that really worked out. Well, the, I, I knew Mr. Wallace Jackson. He was one of the adults who did sign up to work with us um, when we were trying to get the Freedom Democratic, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party of Dallas ready to take to the Atlantic City Convention. But um, you had Armstrong Tire Rubber Plant Company in Natchez. There were very few factories in the state of Mississippi. 
And so the working class consisted of people who were working on the coast for the um, shipping company. Uh, it was not that much organized labor, so to speak. So I'm not quite sure. You know, Mississippi is, was not that industrialized. But I think in the cities, there were people doing, for the most part, um, African Americans in the cities, if they were working in the, they were doing pretty menial jobs, but, but, so in that sense, they were working class people. They were not factory people, for the most part. Agricultural workers, not industrial workers, is the best way to understand right. uh, workers in Mississippi, certainly in those days. Hi, my name is Danielle McGuire. Um, uh, I teach at Wayne State University. And um, someone just asked a question about white supremacist use of the fear of interracial sex as kind of a political tool to bring whites together to, I think, oppose uh, integration and to thwart the movement. But I'm really interested in the ways in which white supremacists use sexual violence or sexualized violence um, to also thwart the movement. So I'm wondering, if any of you could talk about the ways in which black women activists um, and black women in general in Mississippi were more vulnerable to um, acts of sexualized violence um, instead of perhaps um, physical violence in the way that men were vulnerable to. From who? From whites, white men in particular. Well, I can remember going to the uh, bathroom in Brookhaven, Mississippi, there was a layover. I was on the trailway bus going to Macomb, Mississippi, from Jackson, they stopped and went into this bathroom. The uh, bus station was about as big as this table. I went into the bathroom. When I came out, there were two beefy white men standing on either side of the door saying, black bitch, that's not, this is not your bathroom. Your bathroom is here in the back. They were swinging their head, hands over my head. And I walked to the back and looked, and then it was time to get on the bus. So I can remember another time that I was in the jail in Jackson, Mississippi for Picked in Woolworths, December of 1962. I was put in jail along with Charles Brace, a two-year student, and I was in a cell block by myself, and Jailer Miller came to the cell block and said, Dory, in that civil rights movement, did they teach you all to go with white men? I turned around and said, no, sir, they teach us we're all sisters and brothers, we should love each other. He said, okay, Dora, Meg will be here to get you out soon. And at that point, that was my first time being incarcerated, I realized then that I was vulnerable and at risk. But at no time was I ever attacked physically or verbally. Yeah. Just a, a quick comment on this. Um, one of the people who's spoken about this is Union Blackwell. Um, some of you might know, but uh, there's an interview I did with her, it's not in her book, um, but she talks about being stopped by police uh, on Highway 49, and um, on the side of the road, two cops uh, made her take her pants off, and um, one then looked at the other and said, do you want some of that? So they sort of thought about it and said, no, and let her go, and they left with her naked. She also tells a story that this is in her book. Um, and you might have, Ms. Ladner, a remembrance of this. In the Jackson movement, when the students were, there was the mass incarceration and they were incarcerated at the fairgrounds. Um, she tells the story of that some of the women there were subjected to pelvic exams. And that's the only place I've seen that story told. So that would be one of the places. Perhaps you know more about it. I've just seen documents in the papers I've seen documents about that, testimony about that, in the um, papers from the Medical Committee on Human Rights, but just one or two documents, and maybe John Dimmer can talk about that too. But. John, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you know anything about this from the work you did on the doctors? No, I haven't seen anything. Yeah, I think that the um, thank you um, for all the work that you've done. Um, I'm Rebecca Hill from Kennesaw State University, um, and I, I'd like to ask you about the international politics in SNCC, and now looking back, um, what you think the significance of that was, um, uh, you know, Vietnam, Israel, um, 
I remember uh, from the Smith papers being very shocked to see uh, hate mail to Nathan Schwerner following uh, a fundraising letter that had gone out uh, because of, of the position on Israel. Um, so I just, it, it's, all, it's always stuck in my mind. So I, I just wanted to hear what, what you think now about how that happened, what the impact was for the movement. International politics and SNCC or transnationalism uh, undergo several different phases in the organization. The, 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 and, and this is really rough, but the first phase is an obvious one, the emergence of independent African nations about the time that SNCC is born in, in the early 1960s. I mean, just that image of, of Africans throwing off the chains of, of colonialism had an influence on SNCC. The, the slogan we used in the voter registration campaign, uh, one man, one vote, comes from the Zambian independence movement, or what was then the Nyasaland independence movement. And remember, at historically black colleges and universities, you had a presence of African students who were engaged in conversation with us as students and us as activists. Um, now, there are interesting specifics, with this. for instance, with the emergence of uh, one of the spurs, for instance, to the activism of the Nonviolent Action Group, which was the Howard University campus group, was the fact that with the emergence of, of independent African nations and diplomats in Washington, D.C., they were encountering discrimination in housing, and because they more often drove between Washington, D.C. and New York, the United Nations, if they, if they wanted to get something to eat, there were lots of incidents. There were enough incidents for John Kennedy and, uh, and uh, who was Secretary of State? Did, uh, Russ. Russ, to form a special protocol office in the Department of State, of the State Department to try and address this issue, run by a Cuban, uh, Pedro San Juan whose idea was sort of, well, somehow we can figure out how to distinguish between Africans and black <laughs> Americans. <laughs> we can kind of solve this problem. And that spurred from the Howard University campus, you know, a lot of protests along what was then before I-95, Route 40. Uh, uh, and John Kennedy had a rather flippant attitude about this. He said, at one point, he says, well, I always fly to New York. Why don't these Africans fly to New York instead of driving to New York? Uh, so, uh, what eventually uh, ended this, of course, was the 1964 um, uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, 1964 uh, Public Accommodations Act. The other important influence, certainly on SNCC and CORE, was Franz Fanon, who brought to our attention the Alger Algerian independence movement and more for lack of a better word, intellectually, uh, the, the argument that armed struggle for independence was mentally liberating. If you read Wretched of the Earth or Black Skin's White Mass, you get this Martinican psychiatrist who was working with the Algerian FLN or Front of the Liberation of, 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 of Algeria, this kind of argument. And that he was widely read by people in SNCC and core, and he was a name, you know, right up there with thinkers that we wanted to think about. Uh, and was, you know, and, and lastly, the liberation movements uh, later on in the 60s uh, uh, in Southern Africa, Mozambique, Angola, South Africa, uh, not in Southern Africa, but Guinea-Bissau, uh, a number, and these leaders wrote you know, we're reading Amakal Bra. You know, we're reading uh, these activists, these liberation fighters, and, and that's influencing uh, the organization. And, and we finally are going to some of these places. Harry Belafonte organized a trip for SNCC people to Guinea. Uh, John Lewis goes on to Kenya, where he meets both former Mau Mau's and he meets Malcolm X. Uh, you know, a, a number of us are going. And of course, the Vietnam War, to take it out of, is important to us, certainly as young guys, all of draft age. Uh, so uh, aside from our political disagreement with the Vietnam War, there's the very practical question of what to do if you get drafted. 
and, and very few SNCC guys went into the Army, and until you really reached the height of the anti-draft movement, the Army didn't much care to have us. <laughs> Marjorie Spur from the University of South Carolina, and I have, thank you very much for sharing your stories with us. Um, I have a comment and a question. The comment is that um, I'm so glad you're telling a lot more about what happened in Hattiesburg. Um, I spent many years of my career down at the University of Southern Mississippi, and one of the most moving and gratifying things I've ever seen as a historian was seeing the African-American community in Hattiesburg and Palms Crossing come together with the, historic, the faculty of a university that had killed its first black abdomen. And yet, in the years I was there in the 90s, it was just really something to see uh, Ray Lonnie Branch and um, Daisy Wade Harris and her son Anthony and Mrs. Damer and her family um, worked together with Neil McMillan and Charles Bolton and many others in that oral history program. And um, I got to teach Freedom Summer courses and they, along with Ed King, would come and speak to our classes. And it was just extraordinary. And all of you have the benefit of all of the work that all of those oral historians and the community did together um, at the tip of your fingers on the internet. Um, you were such a hero there. And one of the most moving things I ever saw was at Palmer's Crossing when Victoria Ray Adams led uh, a special church assembly that was going on with the, the summer volunteers who had come back and all of the people who had hosted them. The comment, the, the question is this, in the New York Times this past Sunday, uh, many of us saw the article that was talking about how the state of Mississippi is now planning to build a civil rights museum. Diane Nash was on our campus at South Carolina in February, and she, she pointed out that one of her concerns is about the nature of um, the efforts to benefit um, off of tourist dollars in various places to benefit off of the interest in the civil rights movement. Do you feel like that's what's happening now in Mississippi? Do you think that Haley Barber and the Republican aspirations to, to make up with the black community is having an effect? Um, what do you think is happening in our, is this a, something that people need to be on the alert for in lots of places? Uh, thank you. I think you have to be on the alert once again to this question of laundering of history. Um, I don't think that um, Haley Barber would tell the same history that some of you would tell. I'm quite sure he would tell the same history that any of us would tell. Um, Mississippi and just about all southern states, particularly where there were active movements, uh, began discovering about a decade or so ago that there was money to be made from civil rights tourism. As the head of, as the, head of the Chamber of Commerce of Selma, Alabama told me when I was working on a travel book to civil rights sites that we moved from civil war to civil rights. And that's all about money. That's all that that's about. And I don't know, I, the cynical reporter in me says it's probably unstoppable. And the uh, Hattiesburg is supposed to be developing the Civil Rights uh, Museum without the participation of the community people. Jackson, Mississippi, as far as I know, is going to build a Civil Rights Museum next door to a Mississippi History Museum. <coughs> you have State Archives there, which I've used quite a lot. But also, you're going to have two competing museums, and they are controlled by the state. And I'm very cynical about the history that's being told. Revisionist history, I despise. <coughs> and I have yet to really see a true uh, picture of history. I get very annoyed when I get a dream, a speech, and nothing else. I just wanted to throw in one quick thing about this, because on 
there's a big debate within the veterans community around the status of the Mississippi Museum. And uh, it is the case that um, proposals for this have been going on forever, but it finally got sort of over the bar when Haley Barber, Governor Barber, um, sort of gave it his imprimatur, and it was no coincidence that that was at a time when he was kind of testing his presidential prospects, and this was clearly. So, I mean, there's ample room always for cynicism. There was also a decision made, and it was handled rather hand-handedly by the state, um, where they, when they announced that, yes, there were going to be two museums, but they would, they would be separate, but they would be funded equally. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine some of, the, some of the responses, which were a lot like these. But it should also be said that the main impetus for having the Civil Rights Museum, a standalone museum, came from people within the veterans community themselves, who wanted that and insisted on that. And the, there is a, a group of Mississippi, veteran, Mississippi veterans of the Civil Rights Museum, and they are represented on the board of that museum. So I think Diane Nash's position, I mean, Ms. Nash said to me that her advice to people was, um, don't give them any of this stuff, just put it in your closet. And as a historian, I got to tell you, that uh, alarmed me. And I think that uh, my sense is that a majority of the people in the Mississippi veterans community are um, probably in favor of the movement, but I, I also sort of take the position that it's up to them to decide and not to me and not to us. Thank you very much. My name is Carrie Pimblocks. I'm a professor at the University of Wyoming in African American Studies, and I really appreciate this panel. I love talking about studies today. So, um, I just wanted to ask you a short question, which was um, civil rights struggles or activism in general's process to change the world around you, uh, to transform it, to remake the world. And certainly, you did that through your engagement and, uh, and, and have since. Uh, so I'm curious though, about the other side of that, which is that engagement and activism it changes us too as people. And I'm curious how you felt your experience in this particular moment of your struggle uh, changed you. Uh, uh, Lawrence Guyot told me once, you can't battle institutions without changing yourself first. And I, I think that's true. I mean, what you raise is something long and complicated. I can tell you this piece of the impact of the work in Mississippi on me personally, and that is to go into these communities not knowing very much about them. Remember, I'm a guy in Mississippi from Washington, D.C., who had gone to high school in Springfield, Massachusetts. So you had to, in order to work meaningfully, in that community in order to even earn the right to work in those communities where people were judging you uh, in terms of your seriousness uh, and commitment. In order to do that, you had to learn how to listen to people and you had to learn how to speak to people. And in my later life as a reporter bouncing all over the world, often in communities that I knew very little to nothing about, I found that those skills that I got in Mississippi were valuable. Yes, uh, I'm Ray Arsenault from the University of South Florida. Oh, I'm sorry. He pointed to me. Well, my work in Mississippi has continued throughout my life. I say that I dedicated my life to, to uh, bringing about change, and to this day I still actively engage in a struggle that is about bringing about peace and social change in the country. I went to visit Dr. Noam Chomsky at MIT two weeks ago in Boston. I was attending the Women's Liberation Conference at Boston University, and I made a detour to go and visit with him, and I felt that I was in the presence of someone who's such an intellectual thinker who's about bringing about change that I would just learn something from him. So we had a mutual admiration meeting and uh, <laughs> I, I felt good because he said to me that you shouldn't be thanking me. I 
I should be praising you. I said, but Dr. Chomsky, we need allies. Mm -hmm. And there's a constant struggle to keep meeting new people to keep change, exchanging ideas. You never want to sit down and say, well, I did this, but to constantly seek knowledge and to learn from people. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about the prior interruption. Uh, I'm Ray Arsenault from the University of South Florida. And I'm curious uh, about your sense of the, the Northern College uh, volunteers, the ones who were trained in Ohio. Uh, I remember the kind of a famous apocryphal story about the, the student the night before he's supposed to go to Mississippi and he's scared to death and he's asking God to go with him to Mississippi. I know you've all heard it. And finally, the voice of God comes out of the top of the dorm room. I'll go as far as Memphis. And, uh, and so it tells you something about what they were they were thinking, but I'm curious about two things. One, your sense of how those volunteers behaved, uh, how well the training was, and what the long-term legacy was for them. Did, they, did their commitment last to the movement in, in most cases? Do uh, uh, you think that it wasn't just Freedom Summer for them, but, but more of a, lot, a lifetime commitment? Well, I think a lot of them were changed by the experience. I think they came to Mississippi with, with a certain naivete. They came to Mississippi with a certain ignorance uh, uh, and perhaps some prejudices, uh, like, and, and the one I encountered the most often was that people who aren't well educated aren't smart. <laughs> you know, that's part of the culture that they grew up in. Uh, it's hard to measure in any kind of quantitative way what you, what, you know, uh, and give you a quantitative answer. Part of the quantitative answer is, I think, something like 80 of the volunteers uh, really stayed on after the summer. That caused its own set of problems inside Seneca Corps, by the way, or inside the Mississippi movement. But that's a substantial commitment from, from 80 people. And we see uh, some of the effects of the summer project from the on white students who came down in terms of what they did later on. Mario Savio, who worked in Holmes County, comes immediately to mind uh, in terms of his free speech movement that he launched at Berkeley. Or we see some of the roots <coughs> in, in the women's liberation movement. Because really, for some of these young women, you know, the, the, the infamous Stokely Carmichael quote, so often taken out of context, notwithstanding what the women saw were people like Dory, or like Muriel Tillinghast, or like Cynthia Washington, uh, a range of women who were leaders and organizers, Mrs. Hamer, Mrs. Gray, Mrs. Devine, you know, Janie Brewer, I could go on and on and on. Uh, and I think that, that was minimally one of the inspirations for the, the woman's liberation movement. I think the challenge of what, what the movement represented to open up to a lot of <coughs> young people who became involved with it in the South, it was for the first time they began to recognize that it was possible to organize meaningfully for social change and social justice. They weren't seeing that in the communities they lived in, those kind of insular, and we talked about the students, almost overwhelmingly middle, upper middle class uh, students. They weren't seeing anything like they saw in Mississippi. And I think, and I haven't talked to every single summer volunteer, obviously, but I think in general, <coughs> what they encounter was influential, inspirational, and they carried it with them for the rest of their lives. Suspicious of the project. Alex Lichtenstein from Indiana University. So we've talked a bit about uh, ways of assessing and reassessing this history. 
So a question would be, uh, how did the release of and discussion around the Sovereignty Commission papers affect your thinking about this history, both in terms of the degree to which the state, uh, the apparatus of state repression was uh, so deep and evil, but also in terms of potential fractures within the movement that perhaps hadn't been so obvious, uh, maybe they had at the time. Well, the Sovereignty Commission has become one of our pet hobbies of recent years. Um, the, the Sovereignty Commission, um, if, if some of you have not spent time to get into those files, they are an amazing, amazing trove. One of, one of the things about the Sovereignty Commission is that at some point, I think it was around 1966, um, when, maybe 65, when the Justice Department was very involved in um, bringing um, voter rights, voting rights suits, um, a memo came down from the director of the Sovereignty Commission to the various investigators on the staff saying, destroy the records. So we know a whole lot of records were destroyed. But there was a particular record, this is one of my favorite Mississippi stories, there was a particular record that is still there. It is the record that says, destroy the records. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot, there's a lot of stuff there. We don't know what isn't there. Um, it is um, a history of a most incredibly repressive um, society that just had no qualms about brutalizing people. Um, how did it, did it cause fractures in the movement? Well, I think it, I think that there were some suspicions that were raised about various people, and in a way that was unfortunate because part of what the Sovereignty Commission investigators did was they tried to drop um, tidbits um, of suggested um, disloyalty where they would get around, and so when, when you don't know how much of anything anybody thought they knew actually was based on reality as opposed to things that were put out there on purpose to cause dissension. Uh, I'm David Glassberg from University of Massachusetts Amherst, and um, I want to pick up on the issue of the fact that all of you, I think, feel that this history is not really very well known by the public. Um, and by way of very brief introduction, uh, this July, after about 45 years of struggle, we're going to be opening up the first historic site in the United States dedicated to the memory of W.B. Du Bois in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And to frame this, uh, what would you like to see historians do to get this story out better? Talk to people. Uh, <laughs> Talk, I talked earlier about revisionists and to sit down and say that I think that what um, Stokely Carmichael meant, uh, I think I knew what Bob Moses meant, but if they are available, why not go, in, go to them? I'm saying very simplistic, but um, I think that while people are still living, you should make every effort to try and get it on record and then argue with them after you have <laughs> consulted with them. <laughs> I think uh, institutionally, uh, and I'm thinking of the academy, colleges and universities, I mean, there ought to be space created for what might be called scholar activists who can formally affiliate or associate with colleges and universities for the express purpose of conveying one, conveying to students and professors in political science, and not just in black studies departments, but political science departments or sociology departments or whatever. It ought to be a way to involve people who come out of the movement, not necessarily people who have the kind of credentials that are ordinary, academic credentials that are ordinarily narrowly mandated by colleges and universities. That's why I call it scholar active, you have to figure out a way to do that. And secondly, alongside that, there ought to be a way that the academy can, since the window is closing, with increasing rapidity in terms of the availability of 
uh, movement veterans, there ought to be a way uh, that colleges and universities can assist movement veterans in getting the story out in writing or minimally uh, in, in digitized form, audio and visually, that sort of thing. Uh, thank you all for your work and your sacrifice and for your comments today. Um, Ms. Ladner, Mrs. Ladner spoke about uh, recent issues uh, that exist in Mississippi today. Um, and I was interested in hearing a bit more about the impact of the legacy of the freedom movement uh, in Mississippi and of projects like Freedom Summer on um, modern issues and sort of um, social matters and political matters. Um, a lot of us have been um, hearing a great deal about uh, the late mayor Chokin Lumumba, um, his activities in Jackson, Mississippi, and also his, um, uh, well, the recent campaign after his death of his uh, son. So I was wondering if you could speak to that um, and whether there are connections. Well, we know that um, the late uh, mayor Lumumba was um, probably, I would say, probably influenced by the summer by the Mississippi movement living in and being educated in Detroit and moving down to Mississippi uh, with, the, with the Republic of New Africa and staying there and becoming uh, an activist lawyer who handled a lot of political cases and subsequently was, um, became mayor and died. But before he, I, I was just, this is a tidbit, before he expired, he was able to uh, sign off on Freedom Summer he was actively engaged in helping us to organize Freedom Summer. He did um, the, the groundwork for that before he died. But um, I hear a lot of talk about freedom schools across the country with the names of Ella Baker. Um, many, many activists' names that, that I've turned around and looked, you know, because I'm so happy to hear them. So I think that a lot of things that we did, we don't even know about. Um, you asked the question, I don't know all the projects that were started, but I do think that we had a great deal of impact across the country. And um, we always have to hear the name spring up, or the projects spring up, the influence. So just one actual plug in closing, and uh, Daphne Chamberlain, if you'll just identify yourself, um, is one of the organizers of a program, a 50th anniversary program that's going to be taking place in Jackson at Tougaloo College where she teaches um, in June of the summer. So if you're looking to um, continue this conversation, you'll have that opportunity. And I s suspect that knowing all of these people that you can continue the conversation with them right now afterwards. So um, in the meantime, uh, please join me in uh, offering them a vote of thanks.